Thank you. So um, this is a collaborative work which we did together with Sergio Alonso and Francis Pont from Barcelona, who did all the modeling and the simulations that I'm going to show today. So you probably all know about cytokinesis and um, uh, how it works. And it's a very interesting process also for biophysicists because there's a lot of cells organization involved. Um, yeah, here you can see several steps. And one of the most important steps is the creation of an actomyosin ring, which uh, can create contractile forces to um, mediate the cytofission and the creation of the two daughter cells. But there are also um, cell cycle independent forms of cytofission for example, in dictyostelium discoideum, there's a form of traction-mediated cytofusion. And you can see this um, when you work with giant dictyostelium cells, which you can create in two ways. So nowadays, we usually use fusion of uh, single cells. Um, this is done by electric pulses, and you can take any dictyostelium cell line to create giant cells with multiple, multiple nuclei and a continuous actin cortex. Um, back in the 1980s, when the first works were done with giant cells, um, myosin knockout cell lines were used because there the, my the contractile ring cannot be formed. And then when you keep cells in sh shaking culture, they uh, grow and grow, but they do not divide and accumulate, accumulate multiple nuclei. So in 1987, two groups published in science their findings. So when you take these giant cells and put them on a, in a glass dish, they will attach to the, um, uh, to the glass bottom and then they use traction forces to divide. So here you can see a staining. Here's a giant cell, which is uh, where two uh, different parts are yeah, dividing via the traction forces and these parts are still connected by a cytoplasmic bridge. Um, and yeah, because back then they didn't publish any movies, I'm gonna show you a movie we did in our lab so this is a uh, dictyostelium wild type cell. It expresses an F actin marker, live act. Um, and you will now see how the cell divides. So it's multinucleated. You cannot see the nuclei, but now you can see nicely how uh, it divides up in different parts, which are connected by these cytoplasmic bridges here. And the motility mode is amoeboid. Probably most of you know the amoeboid motility of dictyostelium. And these cytoplasmic bridges can stay there for some time because the cells move um, yeah, randomly uh, in different directions. And so they don't move apart so fast. And yeah, so for some time you can still see these bridges there. Um, yeah, and then later also in mammalian cells, uh, traction mediated cytofusion was recognized. And that seems to have an important role because it can happen that uh, conventional cytokinesis fails and this can be very dangerous for the genomic integrity of the cells. And so in this case, the cells can use uh, cytofusion by traction forces to create two um, cells with just one nucleus. Um, so the traction mediated cytofusion uh, in Dicti that was known before relied on the pseudopodia that created the traction forces necessary for the cell division. And today I'd like to show you um, a novel form of traction mediated cytofusion where the traction forces are created by actin waves which are traveling at the surface attached membrane of the giant cells um, and these uh, waves then create the forces for the pinch up of daughter cells. Um, so what are these actin waves? Probably most of you have heard about actin waves before so they can, can occur in different cell types of mammalian cells for example for, for neutrophils and neurons and also in fibroblasts, uh, you can see actin waves, and also in fish keratocytes. And one of the most prominent models for uh, F actin waves uh, are ictyostelium discoideum cells. And here it's uh, quite well known what um, creates these F actin waves, waves, because these F actin waves are actually a, uh, a downstream effect of a signaling cascade, which is tri triggered by waves of active RAS. So here's a simplified view of this uh, pathway, which is involved in creation of the waves. We have RAS, which is a small GTPA, so it can be activated, and this activation is catalyzed, catalyzed by RAS gas. Uh, the reverse uh, uh, reaction, so the inactivation is catalyzed by RAS gaps, and NF1 is one very important RAS gap in dictyostelium. Um, then uh, downstream target of the activated RAS are PI3 kinases, which are activated and recruited 
Um, and then uh, the PI3 kinase of phosphorylate PIP2 to PIP3. And uh, PIP3 and activated RAS can then further uh, recruit other proteins, for example, actin polymerization promoting factors. And this then leads to the occurrence of F actin in the areas where uh, RAS, activated RAS is present. So here you can see a giant dictyostelium wild type cell. And we see the bottom uh, of the cell, so the surface attached side of the membrane. And what you see here are foci of F actin, which appear and disappear. And sometimes they also grow, but there are no waves. And yeah, I just told you that dictyostelium discoideum is one of the main models for actin waves. So why are there no waves in actin waves uh, in uh, dictyostelium wild type cells? And the reason for this was just found out recently in 2016 and 17, there were two papers that addressed this uh, problem or yeah, why this uh, is the case, because most um, cell lines we use in dictyostelium uh, research are actually not the wild type cell lines, but laboratory strains which have been adapted to the growth in uh, medium, which only contains uh, sugars and some nutrients, but no bacteria. So usually the, these cells grow on bacteria. And uh, the group of Rob K in Cambridge, they sequenced uh, laboratory strains and they found out that all these cells uh, have a mutation in the NF1 gene, uh, which uh, results in a knockout of this gene. And um, so when we look back at this pathway, the RAS is much more activated. We have more PI3 kinases, which are activated. And then we also end up with more PIP3. And this then results uh, in the creation of these, uh, the occurrence of these actin waves, which you can see here. So this is now a giant cell, which we made in our lab from uh, DDB, uh, from the wild type where only NF1 has been knocked out. So this is no normal laboratory strain, but the wild type where only NF1 has been knocked out. Um, yeah, these waves in the knockout, so in the wild type with the NF1 knockout, uh, in, in many cells, they look like the waves that we already know from um, laboratory strains. So here you can see such a wave. The F actin is labeled uh, with uh, life act again, and here you can see a label for PIP3. So there's an inner area of the wave which is filled with PIP3 and activated RAS. And then the border of the wave, as you can see here, contains high levels of F actin. When we look through this uh, section here, we can see that the intensity at the front of the wave here. So the, uh, the arrow shows you the direction of propagation. And at the front, we usually have a very high F actin peak. And also at the back, there's usually a high F actin peak. And then in the inner area of the wave, you see also elevated levels of F actin and PIP3 and RAS GTP and other proteins. Um, yeah, these waves uh, can show excitable behavior, as you can see here. Collision between waves uh, results in annihilation. So here are two waves which uh, propagate uh, in, the, in different directions and so they collide and then they annihilate. And here you can see what happens if a wave uh, collides with a membrane. So the wave can then uh, push the membrane a bit uh, in the direction of propagation, but usually it's also annihilated after some time. But in this DDB NF1 knockout strain, we also saw a different type of behavior. And, uh, in, many cells we could see that the waves are much more persistent than in the uh, laboratory strains and in some of the DDB NF1 knockout cells. So these waves were, were very persistent and here's one example. So in orange you can see the outline of a giant cell and here you can see a actin wave which is already at the membrane. It's propagating in the direction of these blue arrows and what you will see uh, now is that this big wave will split up in two parts and these two parts will then propagate further and further and create two daughter cells. Um, so here is the movie and you can see now the, the two daughter cells, they are still connected by a cytoplasmic bridges here and they move very persistently in the curve. So one goes up and one goes down and here is the mother cell, um, which is now not connected anymore with the daughter cells. Um, yeah, here is a summary of this process. So um, the wave propagates in the direction of the membrane, it interacts with the membrane. Uh, daughter cells form, there's a cytoplasmic bridge, and then there's pinch off of the, um, the daughter cell. And when we look at the daughter cell, 
the daughter cell is completely filled with an F actin wave, and this wave has the same profile as the wave inside giant cells. So we have high PIP3 levels and also RAS GDP levels in the inner area. And then at the front, we have an F actin peak and also at the back. Um, and when we look at the motility of these daughter cells, they move very persistently. Here you can see the evolution of shape over 320 seconds. Um, and you see they have this fan-shaped, fan shape, so they have shaped like a fan. And here are some trajectories. Um, you can see they move very persistently. Sometimes the trajectory is a bit curved. And um, this type of motility has been uh, yeah, observed before. So already in 2004 in a knockout of a regulatory gene of developmental genes. So knockout of this gene results in different expression of a lot of proteins. And here this group also described uh, this fan-shaped phenotype. And then also later the group of Peter de Riotis observed that when you reduce artificially the PIP2 levels in cells, you have a, a higher percentage or a high percentage of cells uh, which have this uh, fan shape and move, move very persistently. And it was already hypothesized that these cells are filled by an actin wave and uh, our experiments show very nicely that uh, these daughter cells which move with a wave are really filled by an actin wave or by the same kind of actin, actin wave that we see in the giant cells. Um, at the same time that we discovered uh, this, this, uh, this uh, wave-mediated cytofission, we had an ongoing collaboration with Sergio Alonso and we already wanted to simulate uh, waves in giant cells and uh, this came in quite handy for us to try to understand what's, what might be happening in these cells. So this is the model of Sergio. It's based on a model that uh, he first used um, to, dis to simulate uh, amoeboid motility of uh, dictyostelium cells. And um, so this model is very simple or it's not so complicated in terms of uh, all the pathways that are involved because we only assume one activ uh, an activator and an inhibitor in this model. Um, and then there's uh, also noise. Um, there's one very important parameter which is called U0. And this is the, uh, determining the maximal activator levels uh, the activator can have locally in the simulation. Then we have global control, so uh, global control, so which is uh, defining the, uh, the amount of activator. So we only have a finite amount of F activator. And another important parameter is B, which is, uh, can be used to tune the relationship between activator and inhibitor between excitable and bistable. And here you can see the uh, equations for the reaction diffusion, uh, for the, yeah, the reaction diffusion equations. And uh, the second part of the model is a dynamic phase field, which can be formed by the activator. And uh, this is defined here. And so this is used to simulate our giant cells. And here's the global control set, uh, term. And yeah, then you can uh, change these parameters and uh, one condition I want to show you is a condition where these maximal activator levels are low. So U0 is uh, 0.5 here. And uh, under these conditions, we can only see fluctuations of the activator inside the giant cell, but no waves. And this is similar to what we see in the DDB wild type cells, uh, where we also, also only see F actin foci, and sometimes these foci grow a little bit, but uh, we don't see any waves occurring. Um, when you in increase this par parameter U0, uh, the dynamics change because then we get excitable dynamics, as you can see here. So waves of activator occur, they interact with the membrane a little bit, but usually um, the, the waves are not stable at the membranes and are annihilated. And this is very much like what we see in these cells that also show these, ex uh, also show these excitable dynamics um, where we don't have pin shots. But then if we uh, use the same value for U0, but change the, this value B, which defines if the relationship between activator and inhibitor is uh, bistable or excitable, uh, when you change this to a lower value, you can see that now these waves can create pinch-offs uh, from this uh, simulated cell. 
just like uh, in our uh, experimental cells. So this is here a summary of such a pinch off event. So the wave interacts with the membrane and it uh, creates this daughter cell which pinches off and then moves on its own uh, very persistently. So here's uh, the movement of a daughter cell, uh, has this fan shaped, uh, it's fan shaped and uh, also the um, trajectory of these cells as you can see in the star plot here is very uh, persistent. Um, yeah, then in the simulations, you can also several other characteristics uh, that we also see in experiments. For example, we have this limitation of the wave, uh, of the uh, size of waves when they interact with the membrane. So here you see what happens in the experiment. So when a wave is too big, it will split up in smaller waves. And if these waves are too small, they will die and only the, the, uh, the larger waves will survive and can then result in a pinch off. Here you see what happens in the simulation of this wave split up and then you have uh, some stable waves that, which can survive and lead to pinch off. Um, and this then leads to a very um, nice uh, distribution of, of sizes which can be controlled by changing the parameters in the simulation. So this is what we observed in ex experiments. So here's an example of a wave which was too small um, for creating a pinch off event and uh, I measured the size of the waves um, of these unsuccessful pinch off events and we can see here these are the small waves which were not successful in mediating pinch off and uh, here you can see the size of daughter cells which resulted from a successful pinch off event. And they are usually within a uh, yeah, small range, which so the lower limit of this range is the size of normal cells. So they are not never smaller. Or usually they are not smaller than normal sized cells, but they can tw be twice as big. And sometimes they also have outliers, which are much bigger. Um, and the same is true for the simulations. So here we also looked at the maximum area of waves which were not successful in creating a pinch off event like this example here. And they are usually smaller than the single cell size that was defined before. And you can see here by changing parameter B, you can uh, uh, yeah, change the size of daughter cells or the distribution um, of the uh, daughter cells. Um, then, um, yeah, we thought this might be a very nice um, yeah, technique or a very nice mechanism for synthetic cells. So when you have a synthetic cell, which is filled with a uh, actin wave, um, then these waves are very stable when the cells have the size of a normal cell. But when the cell grows, uh, the waves can become unstable. And then you have two stable waves, which can mediate cytofission. And we tested this in simulations. So we simulated small cells and then we increased the uh, size of cells. And then we observed uh, in, uh, in a certain amount of time how high the probability is for the cell to divide in a binary fission event. And you can see with growing size, the probability for division grows as well. Then we analyzed our experimental data and also observed that the higher the area of the uh, cells is, the higher the probability uh, to observe a cytofission event. So you can see such a binary fission uh, of, of a uh, cell with two nuclei uh, that then divides by its binary wave-mediated cytofission. Um, so to sum all this up, uh, wave-mediated cytofission relies on traction forces which are created by the actin waves. Um, the mechanism demonstrates a so far undescribed application of self-organized actin waves and in fan-shaped cells, actin waves drive cell mo motion. And yeah, I also just showed you a potential uh, application for this. And for more details, look in our paper, how cortical waves drive fission of motile cells, which we just pu published this spring. And yeah, shortly, I'd also like to advertise another paper. The story was created in parallel, more or less. This is also based on this paper of Sergio and Michael Stanger and Carsten um, about the am amoeboid, where amoeboid motility was simulated. And here we used a uh, um, model of mainly uh, Eduardo Moreno, a PhD student of Sergio, used this to uh, tune um, some parameters of the model um, to create different phenotypes of uh, dictyostelium cells. So you can see 
that some of the cells show then more amoeboid motility. We, we could create fan-shaped cells and also intermediate type of cells, which I also observed in my experiment, experiments. So some cells switch between amoeboid and uh, fan-shaped motility. And if you're interested in this, look, uh, yeah, please have a look at this paper, which we also just published in Physical Bee. Um, so now I'd just like to um, yeah, thank my group in Potsdam, uh, especially Carsten and Kirsten Sachse, who helped me with the experiments, uh, then Sergio and Francesco, of course, and uh, at the LMB in Cambridge, Rob Kay and Peggy Paschke, who uh, provided us with the knockout strains of the wild type and with the plasmid that we needed to visualize the f -action. And uh, here you can see a movie that, which uh, Sergio created of a binary fission where uh, the cell is growing and uh, once it grows to a certain size, it divides via this binary fission. And uh, now I just thank you for your attention and um, yeah, please ask questions. Okay, thank you Sven, very nice. Um, so, so maybe a reminder for all the attendees. So, uh, feel free to ask your questions in the in the Q and A, uh, and then and then we will ask them. Uh, so far, I don't see any, but there's still time to ask some. Uh, maybe I can ask a, a question. Oh, okay, there is one now. Otherwise, I'll ask something else later. Uh, there's a question here: Is there a relationship between the size of the mother cell and the coefficient b? Um... So, as far so I mean, in our simulations, we define we predefine B. So, um, B is not uh, changed um, over time, and there should be no relation between mass and cell size and coefficient B. If I understand this question correctly, um, if if they want some more clarification, they yeah. can ask in the in the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I was also wondering is, like you mentioned, that for for the the, the pinching off to occur, the system needs to be bistable and, and sort of not excitable. Could you comment on that one? Why that is? I, I didn't immediately get that. Yeah, when you have these excitable waves, they, as I showed in the beginning, uh, waves can interact with the membrane. They can push it a bit forward, but then they annihilate it. Um, so, of course, you have this refractory zone behind the wave and the uh, system is more bistable and the waves are also more stable at the when they interact with the membrane and then they can create more forces there and uh, yeah, propagate uh, further in this direction. Okay, yeah. all right. Another question here, uh, is there an effective growth of the cell in the model? Um, so if the cells are growing which are simulated? I think so, I think, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this, what, what I just showed you, you here on the la last slide was a simulation where Sergio simulated a growing cell, but in all other simulations in our paper and all the simulations I sh showed uh, in this talk, uh, the cell size is constant. So it's predefined by Sergio and then it remains constant. And so these cells are not growing. Any other questions by attendees or by others? Um, yeah, if you have any questions or comments, you can also write an email to me or to Carsten. Yeah. Um, there, there, there. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's another question now coming up. Uh, so do divided cells have any persistent chirality? Again, sorry, the last part I didn't. So, uh, do divided cells have any persistent chirality? Chirality. So, um, what what do you mean by this? Maybe Carson can also answer. If he understood the question. Also, uh, yeah. Um, whether the cells that have been pinched, pinched off have. Uh... Yeah, I guess the question is probably whether um, the trajectories of the cells have a sense of turning. At least yeah. that's what I would. Uh, understand and uh, uh, we did not observe anything like sure. that but uh, I would expect that if you tune the model parameters closely you might find um, fan-shaped cells that go in circles I mean sometimes we have seen that that these fan-shaped cells can go in circles but we have not investigated that in detail but mm -hmm. yeah there might be something like this in fact 
Yeah, in this Physica D paper, there are, there are cells that move in circles, and there, um, I think, uh, Sergio and um, Eduardo saw that when you change some parameters, you can um, influence the uh, trajectory. So if it's really straight or if it's a bit curved. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks again for a great talk. I suggest that we move on to the uh, next one, uh, which is uh, Felix Nollet who will be talking about uh, mitotic waves. So Felix, if you can uh, share your screen. Yes. Is it visible? Yep, it's okay. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Felix. Uh, I work in the lab of 